Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the response to Unitarian Comments, Questions, and Objections playlist and is entitled episode number 25. Before we begin, a short prayer. All blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so my power to speak truth without error, and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God. Any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that any truth I speak, or any scripture that I interpret correctly, is welcome in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Now let us begin the discussion. So we're going to continue looking at Stand on Scripture. There's this video that we're going to look at today. It's uh, Anti-Trinity Course Number 2, Borica, Ecclesiastes, Chapter 12, Verse 1, Creator or Creators. It's an 11-minute video, so it's not very long. And to be fair to uh, Stand on Scripture, please check it out for yourself and see his points. Now, Stand on Scripture is out of the United Kingdom. He's a debater and speaker, and in the last video, I referred to him as a teacher, and he responded by, Erm, teacher? Who said I was a teacher? And I pointed out that he called the video Anti-Trinity Course Number 1. This is Anti-Trinity Course Number 2. And he responded, Where does it say that course means that the person writing or speaking is the teacher? It's simply a name. And here's course out of the Cambridge Dictionary out of the United Kingdom a set of classes or plan of study on a particular subject, usually leading to an exam or qualification and some examples below. And he then responded, the teacher is God through me. Notice he did not capitalize God. That's probably just an oversight on his part. We'll hope. So Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Here's the Hebrew, and there's the word in question. Boreka, creator, Hebrew Strong's word 1254, and there's the rest of the Hebrew. Now, before we get into that, let's go back to the last video. He responded thus, Isaiah 54, 5, Kedos, Proverbs 33, Kedosim, plural holy ones must make Yeshua Jehovah God. Answer, undoubtedly the most ignorant statement I probably have heard. Firstly, the word simply means holy. The word has been used in Exodus 19.6 about a holy nation or Exodus 29.31, a holy place. But wait, what about Leviticus 11.44? Jehovah tells us to consecrate ourselves to be holy. The word is again the same word as Kedosim. Does this make us Jehovah God because we are consecrated holy or holy ones? Same word you used Kedosim. How about the same passage, Leviticus 11.45? Next verse, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The same word used, Leviticus 19. Be holy, for I am holy. Same word used, Leviticus 27. Same word used about us being holy. Leviticus 20.26, 20, also Leviticus 21.6, they shall be holy. Or maybe one which is more blunt, explicit to the context of holy ones is Psalm 89.5 in NASB, holy ones, KGV, saints, you, same used word, Kedosim. This word is also used in the same chapter, a couple verses after in verse 7, the council of the Holy Ones talking in context of the saints who are human beings. Does this somehow make us Jehovah because this word is used for us too? It just goes to show how Trinitarians will use any similar word to fit their nonsense teachings. Oh, okay. All right, so we got Proverbs chapter 30, verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. That's the word in question. Next verse, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Obviously, that's Jehovah God, right? What is his name? Jehovah God. And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell, they're stating that Jehovah God has a son. That's the point that I was trying to be up because in that's in verse 4. They're talking about two persons. Jehovah God, obviously, and Jehovah God's son. And they have a name, and it looks like this son's name is some unknown, secret, wonderful name, possibly, right? Verse 3, kedosim, holy ones. So notice in the KJV, just, they just say, of the holy, it's of the holy ones. And what I was suggesting is in context, right? Who cares how it's used in other verses, right? The word his is here. So what does that mean? Oh, let's look how it's used in other verses. No, let's look at the context. So the context of verse 3, when they use the word kedosim, obviously, is the next verse. And the Holy Ones must be Lord God the Father and His Son. That was my point. 
Now let's just think about this, all right? Now again, God is above us, but let's just use human logic. Talking about Lord God and his son. Now in the physical universe, if I'm a son, right, and I have a father, I also have a mother, right? So I'm half the genetic material, half the information of my father, half the information, half the genetic material of my mother, and I've, I'm made of you know, physical material out of this universe. Now, we're talking about God and his son. There's no mother here. So there's just a father and there's just a son. So the son, all the information, 100% of the information of that son would be from that father, right? It would be almost like a clone, right? Again, these are just illustrations. And God is uncreated. God is not made of created material. God is made of whatever that divine substance, that divine essence is, right? And that's all there would be. So that sun would be made of that same essence or same substance. Do you see? So just acknowledging that there's a divine father and a divine son, and it's being referred to right here, and that was the point of kedosim in verse 3. Nothing that stand on scripture is bringing up on the left takes away from that. Do you see the point, though? Because if you have an eternal father, that means you have an eternal son. You can't have a father without a son. You can't have a son without a father. If the father was eternal, the son was eternal. All the information in that son came from, comes from the father, identical in that manner of speaking. The substance of the son is the substance of the father. And if the father's substance is divine, beginning is an eternal, so is the son. If the father is divine, so is the son. Do you get the point? Just from that logic, right? And this reinforces it. Okay, so if you have a divine father, you have a divine son, there you go. The son is divine, the son is God. Proving the point, there's a family, there's a being, there's a father, there's a son, there's a spirit. That was the point of the Kedosim in this verse, but there's more to it. Notice the ascended up into heaven or descended. Do we have the father doing those things? We have the son, don't we? Genesis 28, 12, Jacob. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. John 1, 51. And he, Lord Jesus, saith unto verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And then chapter 2 begins with the wedding of Cana and his first uh, miracle. John chapter 3, verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Oh, so Lord Jesus ascended and descended, actually descended, ascended, right? And um, notice what he's teaching Nicodemus. Here I am, Nicodemus, with you in this physical corruptible body, but even right now I'm in heaven. I'm in more than two places at the same time. Omnipresent, divine. John chapter 16, verse 28. I came forth from the Father. I'm a person. I came forth from the Father as a person. Am and come into the world. So I descended into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Ascend. Notice it proves he was a person that preexisted. He ascended. He descended. Oh, so he's the divine son of God being referred to there in Proverbs 30, verse 4, who was one of the kedosim. And these kedosim were just two. It wasn't the saints. It wasn't the angels. It wasn't some divine counsel. It was two holy ones, the Father and the Son. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Now that he, Lord Jesus, ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Next verse. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Wow, he's omnipresent yet again. He fills all things. Lord Jesus fills all things in heaven, all things in earth, and apparently all things beneath the earth as well. Stand on scripture. What does this prove? That Jesus is holy? LOL, what's your point? Hmm, he can't see any of this, can he? And then the point of the name, Exodus 23, 21. Beware of him, referring to the angel of the Lord. And obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. So wait a minute, this angel of the Lord can forgive sin, but only God can forgive sins. Oh, he's divine, for my name is in him. My name is in him. Who I am is in him. Hmm. Judges chapter 13, verse 18, we got the King James rendering and the New King James. And the angel of the Lord, again, said unto him, this is Manoah, the father of Samson, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? 
And then the new King James, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Wow. So the angel of the Lord, who has these divine abilities, being able to pardon sin with the name of the Lord in him, has a name that's secret and wonderful. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, an obvious prophecy of the Messiah to be born, Lord Jesus Christ, in the future. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. The exact same Hebrew word, Pele. Oh, so his name is the angel of the Lord. Yes. So that divine angel of the Lord, who can pardon sin, is going to be born in the future in the human body of Jesus of Nazareth, who also can uh, um, pardon sin, right? Yes. Counselor, the mighty God, Il Gibor, only used for Almighty God. The only other time it's used in Isaiah chapter 10. The everlasting Father, the source of eternal life. Why? By seeing and believing upon the name of the Son, we get eternal life and the Prince of Peace. The idea of him being peace, reconciliation between God and mankind. You see that first in Genesis 49.10, and remember when Lord Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 20 appeared to the disciples, basically he ends up saying peace to them three times. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9, Therefore God also highly exalted him and granted to him the name above every name. Huh. The most wonderful name that exists. Is that the name of Jehovah? Possibly. If so, there you go, right? My name is in him. He's granted back the family name. Is the name of Jesus greater than Jehovah? And if so, what does that mean? Or is it, again, this secret, wonderful name? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, this is talking about his glorified body, as he hath by inheritance, right, the inheritance of the Son of the Father, it's a divine inheritance, obtain a more excellent name than they, there you go. Revelation chapter 19, verse 12, his eyes, this is, Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb coming to earth with the uh, armies of heaven, which are glorified saints most likely, to defeat the kings of the earth and the armies of the beasts of the sea and the false prophet. His aim, or excuse me, his eyes were as a flame of fire, flux piros in the Koine Greek, and on his head were many crowns because he's king of king and lord of lords. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. There it is, the secret wonderful name. And again, it's first alluded to in Proverbs 30, verse 4, and standard scripture sees none of this. I wonder why not. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 about the flux piros. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, Moses, in a flame of fire, flux piros. Out of the midst of a bush, it was a thorn bush. And he looked, and behold, the born bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And by the way, I'm not going to show this right now, but later in this particular chapter, the angel of the Lord is referred to as God, and the Lord, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and declares himself um, Yote Vave and declares himself the I am that I am, the ASRAA, the Ego Ami On, which we will look at a little bit later. Wow. That stand on scripture states this. Wait, did you just say the old bod was the Old Testament erm? Seriously? We, the body, is old bottle, but we have to be anew so we can receive a new spirit, which is the wine. Nothing to do with testaments. Man, this is going to be good for tonight. Cheers. So. Wow, so he can really spiritually see things, can't he? Or maybe he can't. <clears throat> this comment refers to this, Luke chapter 5, verses 36 to 39. And he spake also a parable unto them, No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old, if otherwise then both the new maketh the rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drank old wine straight would desireth new, for he saith the old is better. Now to get to his point, do we only get the Holy Spirit after we get our glorified bodies? That's not true. So if I'm understanding what standard scripture is saying, he's saying the Spirit is the wine and the, um, the new garment is the new bodies we're going to receive in the future. And the new bottles are the new bodies we're going to receive in the future. If that's true, if his interpretation is true, that means none of us get the Holy Spirit whatsoever until we have glorified bodies. Well, none of us have glorified bodies. That would mean that none of us have the Holy Spirit, and we know we do. So your interpretation stand on Scripture is false. Okay? Seriously. Seriously false. Okay, what I was suggesting is that the old here refers to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. The new here refers to the New Testament, the New Covenant. And verse 39, who had the old wine? 
the Old Covenant, in my interpretation. That would be the Jews. And notice they didn't want the New Testament, right? So notice this, no man also having drunk old wine straight away desireth new, for he saith the old is better. Well, wait a minute, old wine, old spirit? How do we drink an old spirit? We don't have a living spirit. So again, that doesn't make sense. So the old is the Old Testament. The new is the New Testament. So, and again, further validation of what I'm saying here. Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. So again, if standard scriptures interpretation is correct, if I'm, if I'm understanding what he's saying, so what happens is if the Holy Spirit is placed into these corruptible bodies, are these bodies break? No, that's the greatest thing for us is to have the Holy Spirit within us, right? Our bodies don't break. So that, again, is false. He doesn't understand it, just like he doesn't understand what I was talking about in Proverbs chapter 3, or excuse me, verse uh, chapter 30, verses 3 and 4. Mark chapter 2, verse 22, And no man puts new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put into new bottles. So what I was saying is that the wine is the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the New Testament, right? Right? For an old covenant, an old contract to be broken, someone has to die. Well, he died, and that's how we get the New Testament, the new covenant. Why? By his blood, by the wine. Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. And again, the old being the Old Testament, the new being the New Testament. Another reference to that. Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. Then said he unto them, therefore, every scribe, what's a scribe? Someone who studies scripture, which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven, Remember, we need to enter the kingdom of heaven like babes, and we drink the milk, but some of us, right, are scribes, we want to be scribes, we want to study the word, right, we want to be instructed into that kingdom of heaven, we want to eat the meat, right, is like unto a man that is an household which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old, right? New Testament, new teaching, Old Testament, old teachings. And then to really prove the point, John chapter 2, again, that first miracle. Uh, verses 9 through 11. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was. Remember, the wine is going to represent the blood of Lord Jesus. Again, going back to Genesis chapter 49, you know, verse 10, 11, when it has this prophecy of the, basically, of the Shiloh, the Messiah to come, his clothes are what? Are, are drenched in the blood of grapes, right? So again, the blood, the wine, his blood that would be spilled, right? The suffering servant, the sacrificed lamb. And knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Remember, the bridegroom represents Lord Jesus. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. See, the better wine, the better covenant, the better testament comes later. This beginning of miracles to Jesus in Cain of Galilee manifested forth his glory. And his disciple believed on him. Okay. There's much more spiritual truth here. Notice it was water that the Jews would use to purify themselves by washing the outside. Notice what he did. He turned the water into wine which they drank, representing his blood which cleans you from the inside. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 to 29. You know, standard scripture basically laughs at the idea of the wine representing the New Testament, the blood of Christ. Really? Verses 27 to 30, uh, 29. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, the wine, for this is my blood. Oh, the wine is the blood of the New Testament. Oh, really? Which is shed for many of the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this food of the wine until that day when I drink it new. Oh, remember the new wine? With you in my Father's kingdom. I mean, it's right there, stand on scripture. Mark chapter 14, verses 23 to 25. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them about the wine, this is my blood. The wine is the blood of the New Testament. Oh, so the wine is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Nothing to do with testaments. Wow, you are blind, sir. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. The New Testament, the new covenant is what gets you to the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, After the same manner also, he took the cup, 
Notice how many times this is mentioned. It must be important when you stop saying, this cup of wine is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Remember, how do we get eternal life? How are we raised at the last day? By seeing and believing upon the Son. How also? By eating his flesh and drinking his blood. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Notice belly, his belly, and living water comes out of it. But this spake he of the Spirit, so he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Remember, it descended, remained upon him after his baptism in the river Jordan. John chapter 19, verse 30, verse 34, verse 35. On Jesus on the cross, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, what is that, sour wine? He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, gave up the spirit. Verse 34, but one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, pierced his belly, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Hmm. Spirit, living water. Verse 35, and he, John, that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. So it seems like this is very important. Notice the very next verse, it stated, I saw it, you know, John saw it, I'm bearing record. My record is true. I know it's true, you need to believe this. It must be really important. First John chapter five, verse eight, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. You see the connections to wine. Revelation chapter 14, verse 19 and 20, and then Revelation 19, verse 15. And the angel thrust in his, this is the reaping of the unrighteous, and the angel thrust in, or the tares really, uh, sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Notice this wine reference again. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles. What's that? Five and a half feet, something like that. By the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs, which is, I guess, 200 miles. That's a lot of wrath of God. And notice the wrath of God connected to grapes, and wine and blood and then revelation 19 verse 15 the other uh, um, statement of this and out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword uh, this is the lamb the god man lord jesus christ coming down again to defeat the um, armies of the uh, kings of the earth and the beasts of the sea and the false prophet that with he should smite the nations he should rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god very important spiritual stuff stand on scripture sees none of it and then mocks people Interesting. Now let's go back to today's video. Boreka, and that Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1 creator. So notice that particular Hebrew word is only used one time right here. It's a derivative of Hebrew Strong's 1254, bara, to shape, create. The first time a derivative of that word is used is in the very first verse of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning. Bada, created. What does that remind you of? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Logos was God. Huh. Who's this Word? Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. I like the rendering of the Brian Study Bible. He, this is the God man, this is the Lamb, this is Lord Jesus Christ, is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God, Logos to Theo. So that word in the beginning with God, who was God, was Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son that we first saw there in Proverbs explicitly. 30 verse 4, and called Kedosim, along with his father in 30 verse 3. John chapter 1, verse 3, referring to this word that we know is the divine Son who took on flesh, who became the person of Lord Jesus Christ. All things, all things in heaven and earth were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 10, he was in the world. This is referring to his ministry. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Again, notice, by the Son are all things. Now, of the Father are all things. Now, notice you'll say, wait a minute, it just says there's one God. 
the Father, and there's one Lord. So you could look at it, well, if there's, if one God is the Father, that means that Lord Jesus can't be God. Well, if that's true, if there's one Lord that's Jesus Christ, you're, you're telling me the Father isn't Lord? You know the Father's Lord. So one God doesn't mean that the Son can't be God. And just like one Lord doesn't mean the Father can't be Lord. Now, what's even more interesting is the one Lord in the Koine Greek is Iskirios and Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Shema Yisrael. Well, in the Koine Greek, Akue Israel, Kyrios Othios, someone Kyrios Is Estin. So God is one means Kyrios Is, and notice they called Lord Jesus in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the Is Kyrios. Oh, just coincidence, right? And then again, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So obviously the kingdoms of our Lord is the Father. But wait a minute. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says the one Lord is Jesus Christ. But here it's saying the Father's Lord. Exactly. So just because Lord Jesus is one Lord doesn't mean the Father isn't also Lord. And guess what? Just because in that particular verse, the Father is the one God, it doesn't mean the Son isn't also God. Because if that's the case, then the Father isn't the one Lord, and obviously that's ridiculous. And this verse right here proves it, and I'll show you other verses where Lord Jesus is explicitly called God. We saw one of them in John 1.1, 1, 1, by the way. Colossians 1.16, For by him, by the Son, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Notice, by him, by him, by him, repetition. Not coincidental. That are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be, or in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, power, all things were created by him and for him. Isn't that interesting? So all things in heaven, all things in earth are of the Father, but they're by and for the Son. Notice you see this over and over and over. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. By the Son. Yet again, by the Son. Now, look at this verse, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. This is the Father speaking to the Son. And thou, Lord, notice he's calling him Kyrios. And we saw in uh, the uh, Septuagint rendering of uh, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, how would uh, the Greek-speaking Jews refer to Jehovah? They'd call him Kyrios. And guess what? The Father's calling the Son Kyrios right there. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, going back to Genesis 1, 1, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. So notice when they say, by the Son, by the Son, by the Son, that doesn't mean the Father used the Son as a tool. It means it was by the Son's hands. How do you know the Father just said so? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, For it became him, again referring to the divine Son who took on flesh, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Notice you see this again, for whom, by whom, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And again, the captain of our salvation is Lord Jesus Christ, obviously. The verse before, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So being made is his corruptible physical body in the womb of the blessed Theotokos. So that was created. That's why he's a God-man. He was a person of the divine family of God who took on flesh. So he's fully God and fully man. Right here, this was made refers to that initial corruptible body, which was made like our bodies are made. He joined with creation. Who made that body? Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, referring to the divine son, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man. Notice, he made, together with the Father and the Spirit, but he made his initial corruptible physical body. Why? Because he's divine, because he's God, because he's in the family of God. John chapter 2, verse 19. Well, so he made his initial body. How about his glorified body? John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And again, two verses later, he's referring to the temple of his body. John chapter 10, verse 18. No man taketh it, meaning his life from me, but I lay it down of myself. Noticed we saw earlier, he just, notice he just breathed out the ghost. Remember the other criminals to his right and left, they had to break their uh, legs for them to suffocate. And when they stabbed him and the blood and uh, water came out, he was already dead. He Gave, he laid down his life himself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. He took it again. This commandment have I received of my Father, 
And then Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name, than they were repeating this verse, but we're looking at it from a different perspective, talking about his glorified body. And again, going back to what it seemed Stan of Scripture was saying, uh, no, we don't get the Holy Spirit only when we have our glorified body, which none of us have right now, only Lord Jesus has. So that would mean no one has the Holy Spirit. And of course, you know that's true. So your interpretation there is false, like pretty much all your interpretations are false, sadly. Now, continuing in the created, uh, bara, uh, the next time we're gonna see that, that we're gonna look at at least, is Genesis 1:27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and there it is, so created. Uh, way yibra here, it's again the same Hebrew Strong's word, but notice in his own image, in the image. Now in the Septuagint, image is ikona, like that's the, where icon comes from. There's the rest of the uh, Hebrew. Genesis 126, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I cut that off, sorry about that. Notice, let us make in our image according to our likeness, conjugate plurals all. And this <laughs> is God speaking. This is not God and the angel speaking. There's more than one person here speaking our image. Hmm, that's Old Testament. Remember, we learn more about the New Testament. What do we learn in the New Testament about this? A ikona, again, is the Koine Greek word for image. Colossians 1.15, New King James Version here. He, being the divine Son who took on flesh, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Oh, so the Father and Son share an image. Oh, so as the Father and Son, that's the us. So the Father and Son were going to make man in their image after their likeness. Oh, I got gotcha. you. And again, ikon. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, referring to the Son in reference to the Father, who being the brightness of his glory. So the Son is the brightness of the Father's glory. And the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Think of what that just means. Everything in heaven, everything in earth is upheld by the word of power of the Son. When he had by himself purged our sins, there you go again, there's the Lord Jesus, by himself purging sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I'm sorry, if by yourself you purge sins, you're God. Lord Jesus is God. He's the divine son. He's part of the family. <laughs> you know, forgive the illustration. He has 100% the genetic, the divine genetic material that he has with his father. He's a genetic clone of his father, if you want to think of it this way. And every divine molecule in his body is identical to those in his father, comes from his father. He's uncreated. He's divine. He's God. Again, the best way I think is to think of it as a divine, eternal family. One being, one family, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the Koine Greek, the express image of his person is karakter tis ipostasios, the exact expression of the substance. The substance of God? The substance of God is uncreated. He's the exact expression of that. Notice you're seeing these points over and over and over. The Unitarian belief system is laughable, is pathetic. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, who, again referring to the divine Son who took on flesh, being in the form of God, morpho tu theu, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Notice he's in the form of God. What's God's form? It's this substance, it's this divine essence which is eternal, beginningless. Uh, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and he's in that form. And notice this, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What's robbery? Taking something you don't own. So what's not robbery? Taking something you do own. So notice, he owned being equal with God. If you're meaning God the Father, of course. So if he's equal with God the Father, he's also God, obviously. John chapter 1, verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, in it, my name is in him, he's in my bosom, <laughs> right? What's in my bosom if I'm the Father? Divine stuff, nothing created, well, he's there. He hath declared him, you also say revealed him, made him known, 
And notice John 14, 19. Jesus saith unto him, to Philip, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? If you see the Son, you see the Father, right? They're, they're in the same image, right? The Son is the perfect image of the Father. Together in their image they made um, humanity. Um, he's, he shares his form. He shares his uh, substance. It's pretty obvious. And then, if you need more, Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. This is John on the island of Patmos. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, obviously Lord Jesus Christ, clothed with a garment, down to the foot. Pay attention to the details. And girt about the paps, which is around, I guess, the chest area, with a golden girdle. So there's this golden color around his chest area. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Remember the flux piros? So his eyes are, you know, burning uh, like fire. And his feet, like undefined brass, again, kind of a golden, amber, yellow color, as if they burned in a furnace or a burning color down there. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. We saw this in Revelation 19 earlier. And his countenance was as the sun shining or shineth in his strength. Notice those details. What does that remind you of? Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I be till the thrones were cast down in the ancient of days, did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, by the way, flux piros again, and his wheels as burning fire. Huh. So notice in Revelation 1, he appears just like the ancient of days did in Daniel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 27. And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward. The loins are what? Kind of in your groin area, upper thigh. If the loins upwards, wouldn't that be maybe the chest, that paps that we just saw in Revelation 1? This amber, golden, brass color. And from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. Notice there's this burning amber color below his loins, just like we see in Revelation 1. And had brownness round about it. So notice again, when you see the Son, you see the Father. There are the, they share the image. Why? They're in the same family. They're both divine, they're both God, but they're not the same person. Now to just mention the Spirit. We saw Genesis 1.1, notice the next verse. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So this was the God and then the Spirit of God. And the God was the Father and the Son. Oh, here's the Spirit. So we saw the Father and Son in uh, Genesis 1.26 kind of contemplating, let us make man in our image after our likeness, right? Notice John chapter 16, verse 13. So they were talking. What was the Spirit doing? Listening? Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So notice, notice how consistent and interconnected the Bible is, because it is true. You need to see these spiritual truths, though, stand on Scripture, right? So notice, the Father and Son are speaking, the Father and Son are creating, the Father and Son share the image, and the Spirit is listening. And then what he hears them speak, he shares with us. And again, you think, so that, what, if you don't think we have the Holy Spirit now, we couldn't understand any of this stuff, right? What does 1 Corinthians 2.14 say? The natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. You need the Holy Spirit to understand any of this stuff. So everything you think is all contradictory. So... And then you mock other people. It's pathetic and, and very arrogant. Uh, continuing with the uh, uh, created, uh, Isaiah 42.5. So I'm not going to go through every single uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, example of this throughout the Old Testament, but I'm going to pick and choose some ones that I think are uh, important. So Isaiah 42.5. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which come out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein, Again, there's the who created. By the way, again, I'm not going to show this, but who gives us the Spirit? Revelation chapter 20, who breathed out the Spirit? Again, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son. So I don't mention that, but that right there is being referenced. Remember, everything in the Old Testament is about the Son, even this verse, and I didn't even uh, notice when I was creating this presentation. There it is, though. Now, though, that's Isaiah 42.5. Let's go to Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant 
whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So notice right there you're having this reference to Lord Jesus, even though in 42.5 there was as well, uh, one as well that I, and there was more. I mean, he's the creator. He created the heavens, stretched them forth. He did all that together with the Father and Spirit. But anyway, there's 42.1, which is obviously about the Son who took on flesh, right? Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall go out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Right? The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Let's count up the spirits. There's the Spirit of the Lord, one. The Spirit of wisdom, two. Spirit of understanding, three. Spirit of counsel, four. Spirit of might, five. Spirit of knowledge, six. Spirit of fear of the Lord, seven. Seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. And interesting, in that verse 1, and a branch is Wenetzer, Netzer, Matthew 2, 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. Who was the greatest of the prophets? Arguably Isaiah, right? He shall be called a Nazarene. So I don't know this is true, but because if you go back to the Old Testament, there are no specific references to Nazareth or Nazarene. So spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Well, he was called a Netzer, when it's there, here in Isaiah 11, verse 1. So I believe there's the connection. I could be wrong, but I believe that's true. Revelation 1, 4, about these seven spirits. Dawn to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Oh, okay, there's Almighty God with the seven spirits before his throne. And we just saw those seven spirits. Revelation 4, verse 5, And out of the throne, this is the throne of Almighty God, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which again are the seven spirits of God. So notice Almighty God has the seven spirits of God. Revelation 5, verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. Here's the God-man, Lord Jesus, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Isn't that amazing? So Almighty God has the seven spirits of God, and then the Lamb has the seven spirits of God as well. That's just a man, that's a God-man. Only God has, has the seven spirits of God. Well, guess what? The Lamb has the exact same seven spirits of God. John, why is this? John chapter three, verse 35, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. So the father loves his son so much, and we're going to see he's loved him from the foundation. There's, he's always loved him, okay? Uh, which again proves he preexisted. You'll see here it's explicitly coming up. So he loved him so much, he gave him all things, including the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 15. I'm going to look at the NIV rendering here. All that belongs to the father is mine. So does the Holy Spirit belong to the father? Yes. So guess what? It also belongs to the son. That is why I said the Spirit will see from me what he will make known to you, right? So he will receive from me because since everything the Father has is mine, the Holy Spirit, which the Father has, is also mine. And that's why he's going to receive from me and make it known to you. John chapter 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Wow, he can do nothing. But what he seeth the Father do. He sees the Father do. For what things soever he, the Father, doeth, thee also doeth the Son likewise. So anything the Father can do, the Son can do. And that's what he was saying when he was in his physical corruptible body prior to his resurrection. Present tense. <laughs> He's divine. He's omnipotent. Anything the Father can do, I can do likewise, meaning in the same manner. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, going back to Isaiah 42. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. So notice he's not going to share his glory with anyone. My glory is my glory. Okay. John chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. They're going to glorify each other. Hmm. Looks like they're going to share glory. They're going to yield glory to each other because they're both the Lord. Otherwise, you're having contradictions. And there's no contradiction. The Bible is true. And that's why the only thing that explains all this stand on Scripture is the Trinitarian doctrine, which you think is lies. You know why? You're blind. John 17, 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Notice, he was in glory before the world, before creation. Therefore, he's uncreated, he's eternal, he's God. 
Listen, if you're uncreated, you're eternal, and you existed before creation, aren't you God? <laughs> there you go. The Father's God, the Son's God. And again, I think the best way of understanding this without contradiction is the one being of God, the one Lord, is the family of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, all sharing the same substance, all sharing the same form, all sharing the same essence, all divine but distinct persons, all sharing the same glory. It's right there explicit. How about this one? John chapter 17, verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. You love a person. The Lord Jesus is a person. He loved this person before creation, before the foundation of the world. They were in love with each other before creation in an eternal state, eternal love. And this, again, is a very important point. Okay, 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So God is love. Part of what God is, is love. So what does that mean? Love is eternal. That proves the point. You can't just be by yourself. Is loving yourself truly love? No, that's some sort of bizarre, weirdo self-love. Love, true love, is is loving another and being willing to sacrifice yourself for another person. The very fact that God is love proves that God is multipersonal. If God is love and if love is eternal and his love, love is not created. So if you want to think, no, love is created and God isn't love. Well, right says right there, God is love and you know God is love. So love is eternal and love is not just loving yourself, it's loving another. So what does that prove? And we saw it in John 17, 24, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit, by the way, loved each other before the foundation of the world. Love, love, love. And you know what? They loved each other so much, they wanted to grow the family. They love that divine family so much, they want a bigger family. And that's the purpose of reality. And that's the purpose of us, of us talking to each other. We want to see and believe upon the Son so we can join the family. We want to be in love forever with God. That's what I want for you, Stand on Scripture right? I want you in the family of God, and you need to see and believe upon the true Son, not this wicked, satanic counterfeit you've created in your mind. Now let's look at Isaiah 43.1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed me, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. And again, Bora Aka, who created you, another derivative of Bara, 1254 Hebrew Strong's word. Let's look at verses 10 and 11, though. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant who I am chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. There is only one God. No God formed before Lord God, no God formed after Lord God, no true God. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, yod He vav He, and beside me there is no Savior. So the only God and Savior is Lord God the one being of God, the divine one being, one creator. Ero emi is how the I am was rendered there in the Koine Greek. Exodus 3.14, and God said unto Moses, remember this was the angel of the Lord speaking out of the bush, who then is called God, who's called the Lord, and here God, the angel of the Lord, said unto Moses, I am that I am, and he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Obviously in the uh, Hebrew, it's uh, Aesereia, but notice in the Koine Greek, keipen otheos prosmos in legon eromion, keipen utos eristis ios Israel o on apeskelen me pros imas. So eromi, I am o on, o on. Notice in the um, Brenton Septuagint translation of that, and God spoke to Moses saying, I am the being. So eromi, I am, o on is the being, the living one, the being. And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, The being, O On, has sent me to you. So I am, O On is the being, the living one, the living being. Oh, okay. John, I'm not going to go over all of these, of course. John 8, 50, Jesus said unto them, the unbelieving Jews, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am, Ero, Emi. One more. John 18, 16, And soon then, as he said unto them, these are the temple guards, come to Take him to the Sanhedrin. I am, notice that he's in italic. So it just says Ero me in the Koine Greek. They went backwards and fell to the ground. So notice when he said Ero me, I am. When they asked, are you Jesus of Nazareth? I am Ero me. It was like power hit them. They were fall, fell backwards. 
They were knocked to the ground by the power of what he said because he's declaring himself God right there. And again, they were blind and couldn't see it. But even though they were blind and couldn't see it, notice what the power did to them. Knocked them to the ground. They went backwards. They were thrown backwards and went to the ground. They pictured them hurling through the air, right? And check this out. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So notice in the Koine Greek, methimon o theos, with us is the God. That's what Emmanuel is interpreted as, methimon o theos. And check out, that's, you know, in the very beginning, the first chapter, you know, one of the prophecies of Lord Jesus Christ would be Emmanuel. That's mentioned in Matthew 1, 23. Notice how Matthew's gospel, the very first of the four gospels, ends in verse uh, 20 of chapter 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Ero methimon emi. And that's just coincidence. So Emmanuel means with us is God, right? Um, uh, methimon theos and the gospel ends with Lord Jesus saying, Ero methimon emi. Ero mi methimon. Again, the power of I am. So that's just all coincidence, right? Stand on scripture. I'm not lying. Maybe it's just coincidence. There's no lying happening, stand on scripture. It's interesting how you lying, you're lying, you're lying. What have I lied? I'm reading scripture. Hey, maybe my interpretation is correct. Now, it's interesting you always say lying. That's what people do if you understand uh, psychology that's called projection. So I wonder what that means. Maybe subconsciously you know you're lying. Maybe that's why you call everyone a liar. I haven't lied. Hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, like I said at the initial prayer, I only pray that if I'm saying something true and if I'm interpreting something true that uh, goes into your mind, heart, and soul. If anything I've stated here, if I've misinterpreted, it's not been purposeful, I'm not trying to lie, I, I'm human. If I've made a mistake, I pray none of it goes into your mind, heart, and soul. But if it's true, truth comes from God, right? Then, of course, I hope that that goes into your heart, mind, and soul and benefits you spiritually, including you, stand on Scripture. John chapter 1, verse 18, looking at the on. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Well, it's, it's, it's described as which is, but in the Koine Greek, it's all on. So truly, it should say this. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, the living one, in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, that's in the only begotten Son. Monogenes Ios. Some of the manuscripts say Monogenes Theos, like the Brian Little Bible. No one has ever yet seen God, the only begotten God, the one being in the bosom of the Father, he hath made him known. But it says the same thing, all on. So, the, the, notice, it's in this, I like the Brian Little Bible because it does say the one being, the living one, the living being, or on. John chapter 3, verse 13, we looked at it before, but notice, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, or on. Or on. It's the Son of Man, the living one in heaven, the living being, the or on. So he's the I am, he's the or on, yes. It's all just coincidence. I'm not lying. Is it just coincidence? No, it's not. It is true. Lord God is shouting out truth in Holy Scripture to you. Open your minds. Unstop your ears. Remove the scales. See the truth. Bend the knee. Call out the name of the true Lord Jesus Christ. See and believe upon him. Kiss the Son. John chapter 1, verse 1. Remember? No gods before me. No gods after me. Only one God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we saw in Revelation 19, that Word is the Son. It's not some idea implanted into a human. The name of the Lamb is the Word of God. That's His name. That's who He is. John chapter 20, verse 28, And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Kyrios mu ke theos mu. He's calling him his Lord and his God. And does Lord Jesus rebuke him or correct him? He surely does not. We'll come back and notice how Lord Jesus responds when Thomas declares this truth. Stand on scripture. What does that remind you of? Psalm 35, 23. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord, my Lord and my God. yod heh vav -he. It's a family. Stand on scripture. One being, one family, three persons. It's easy to understand it, and it is true. Acts 20, 28. Now let's get into all the times Lord Jesus is explicitly called God. We saw it uh, just there in John 1, 1 and John uh, 20, 28, but let's continue. Acts 20, 28. 
Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Wait, 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 wait. God purchased the church or the congregation with his own blood, right? Yeah. But the only person of God who spilled blood was Lord Jesus Christ the Son. Yeah. So what does that prove? Lord Jesus Christ the Son is also God. Explicitly stated, Romans chapter 9, verse 5. We're going to look at the Berean literal Bible rendering here. Whose are the patriarchs and from whom is Christ according to the flesh, being God over all, blessed to the ages. Amen. Explicitly called God. You're right. Usually in the New Testament, God refers to the Father. Usually in the New Testament, Lord refers to the Son. I showed you a verse where Lord refers to the Father, and here are the verses where God refers to the Son. 1 Timothy 1.17, and again, read this doxology, it is about the Son, now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So, in the beginning of John 17, it does refer to the Father as the only true God, but notice here, the Son is referred to as the only wise God. So obviously, the only true God doesn't mean that the Son isn't God, because if that logic is true, that the only wise God here is the Son, that would mean the Father is not God, which you know is not true. Titus 2.13, Brian Literal Bible um, rendering, awaiting the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's no God and Savior but Lord God. Well, guess what? Lord Jesus Christ is our great God and Savior. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, again, Brian Study Bible, Simon Peter, a servant apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. So notice, unless the Bible's false and the Bible's true, unless the Bible's full of contradictions and it's not, the only thing that explains this is the Trinitarian doctrine that you call lies. That's how blind and lost you are, stand on Scripture. It's sad. Let's finish off. Revelation 5.13, And every creature which is in heaven. What are creatures in heaven? Saved humanity, angelic spirit beings, and on the earth, living humans like you and I, and stand on Scripture, and under the earth, what, like demons in Tartarus, the abyss, like unsaved, the unrighteous in Hadesh Sheol, and are such, and such, excuse me, as are in the sea. What are those who died in the flood? Maybe, I'm not sure. And all that are in them. Notice the exhaustive use of languaging by St. John. Heard I sang. So it says, every created sentient being that exists or ever existed or will exist. Heard I sing, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, almighty God, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Notice they're sharing glory, they're sharing honor, they're sharing power, they're sharing blessing. And they're in a separate category from all creation. You have all creation in one category. And in the separate category, what's that? That's the uncreated. Oh, so Almighty God's uncreated. The being of God, the family of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Lamb, the God-man, Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, the man part of him was created, but the God part of him wasn't. And that's why the Lamb, the God-man, is in the uncreated category. Revelation 22, 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Who's speaking? This is the very final chapter of the Bible. Obviously, some important truths are going to be taught here. Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So obviously, Revelation 22, 12 is the Son of Man speaking, right? John 5, 22, for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Again, the Son is going to be doing the judging. The Son is going to be re rewarding all of us according to our work, mine, yours, and stand on Scripture, right? Matthew 25, verse 31 to 32, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the only judges with, with him, then he, excuse me, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. This is the great white throne we're going to see in Revelation 20 coming up. And before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from his goats, right? The sheep on the right, the goats on the left. Revelation 20, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Whoa. So we saw how Lord Jesus was creator together with the Father and Spirit. Looks like Lord Jesus is the one who destroys the old heaven and old earth. Why do I say that? Notice, the earth and the heaven flee from his face. His mouth is where his face is. His burning eyes, right? Flame of fire where his face is. And there's found no place for them. So if you flee heaven and earth from the face of Lord Jesus and no place is found for you, what does that mean? Surely it seems to mean that you're destroyed. Look at the next verse. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Wait, who's sitting on this great white throne? That's Lord Jesus Christ about to do judgment. Notice they're standing before God. What does that prove? Lord Jesus Christ is God. It's right there, stand on Scripture. And it's not just this verse, every verse. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And we know who's doing the judging is the Son, not the Father. That's the Lamb. 
on this great white throne. How else do you know it? Notice what Almighty God on his throne. It's not a great white throne, it's a different throne. Revelation 4, 3, and he, this is Almighty God on the throne. This is the family of God. This is the being of God. This is the Holy Trinity. This is the triune God. One being, one family, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And he, Almighty God, that sat, oh, excuse me, yeah, that sat, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So this throne looks like an emerald. So Almighty God's throne is like an emerald. It's not a great white throne. That great white throne is the throne of the God-man, the Lamb, Lord Jesus Christ. It's a different throne. So notice that's the Lamb on that throne, and he's being referred to as God in the next verse. We'll get back to it. Exodus 24, 10. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. It doesn't really describe necessarily the throne as being a sapphire, but there's this gem-like quality being suggested at least. Ezekiel 10, verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, and the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So again, notice an emerald, a sapphire stone. This is how Almighty God's throne is described. And notice in Revelation 20, that was Lord Jesus on the great white throne called God in the next verse, and it was a great white throne. It wasn't an emerald throne. It wasn't a sapphire throne. That's Almighty God, God the uh, Holy Trinity. This is the God-man, the person of the Son who took on flesh. And again, how do you know it's him as well? Notice, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. 2 Peter 3, 5, 3, 7, 3, 10, 3, 12. For this they willingly are going to give him, that by the word of God, Logos tu theu, that's Lord Jesus Christ, right? The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So again, calling the word of God creator, verse 7. But the heavens and earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. Remember the word of the Son, by the power of his word, it keeps heaven and earth, it sustains them. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 1, reserved unto fire. So they're kept in store. They're sustained by the word of God, but they're reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition. So when there's a day of judgment, there's going to be fire. Hmm. Who does the judgment? Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, his eyes are like a flame of fire. And, and, and the heaven and earth flee from his face. His eyes are in his face. The eyes uh, have the flame of fire. Fire burns things, doesn't it? And his word is where his face is, right? And his word holds them in store. Well, by his word, they're destroyed, I guess. And by the flame of fire, they're destroyed by fire. Those are his eyes. Second Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as the thief in the night. I'm not going to go over all these verses for sake of time. But we have teachings of Lord Jesus that the day of the Lord who comes as the thief is the day of him, the day of the Son of the Man. And we also see that in the epistles and even in some references in Revelation. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, that's the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There's, there it is. There, and we see that in Revelation 20, verse 11. 2 Peter 3, 12, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, when the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Notice, the day of the Lord that comes of the thief, which is the day of Lord Jesus Christ, is the day of God, and that's when Lord Jesus Christ destroys the old heaven and earth. How, I mean, how, what more do you need? Notice, it's over and over and over and over and over. See the truth, remove the scales, unstop the ears, you know. Have your heart of stone, stay in the scripture, become a heart of flesh. This is the truth. And then, again, you need more. Hebrews 1, this is the Father, again, speaking to the Son. Verse 10, he calls him creator by his hands. Notice what he says in verse 11 and 12. They shall perish, referring to the heaven and earth, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. So the heavens and old shall perish and wax old as doth a garment. Verse 12, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. So who's going to fold them up? Who's going to destroy them? The Son. The Father says so right there. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. And then, so all that proves that Revelation 22, 12, it's the Son speaking. Notice all the truth that comes out of that. And then if you need more, next verse, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, which obviously is direct declaration by the Lamb, by the God, meant that he is divine. He is God, right? And how to understand it? The one being of God is a family, a perfect family, perfect love, eternal, beautiful, and God wants us to join that family. Now we marry in, we're adopted in, we're going to share that last name, we're never going to be of the essence of the family because we're not divine, but he wants us to marry and uh, adopt in. Isn't that beautiful? But you need to see and believe upon the Son in the correct way. 
Again, John 5, 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father, the same as how they honor the Father, identical to how they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. So notice, stand on Scripture, the only way you can truly honor the Father is by honoring the Son in the exact same manner. Well, how do you honor the Father? How do we both honor the Father? We praise Him, we worship Him, we love Him, we consider Him our God. Well, guess what? Do the exact same thing to Lord Jesus Christ the Son. I do, you don't. I'm honoring the Father, you're honoring no one. I honor the Father and the Son equally. And why? Because they're both God. <laughs> That's why John 5, 23 makes sense. It's not just because Lord Jesus is doing the judgment, and He is doing the judgment. We saw what that entails. But notice this, John 5, 41, Berean literal Bible, I do not take glory from men. And that is how the Greek should be best translated. Um, do not take glory. So notice, you should give him glory. He doesn't take it from you, stand on scripture. You have to give it to him willingly, and you're not doing so. John 6, 33, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Notice right there again, he preexisted as a person. It's the, your belief system is a joke that this divine thought get planted in this prophet or whatever you want to think. I came down from heaven. What does that mean? I'm a person. I existed as a person in heaven and I came down from heaven to do the will of my Father. Yes, there is an authority structure in the triune God. The, God, the Father is at the head of that authority structure, just like the Father is at the head of the authority structure of any son, right? But the son is in the family. The son is of that same form, of that same essence, uncreated, eternal, divine, beginningless, Omnipotent. We saw a verse explicitly stating that in John 5. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, divine. I came down from him not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. But notice what the will of the Father is anyway. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, the will of the Father, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So notice what the Father's will is ever, anyway. It's all about the Son. He wants you to see and believe upon the Son. He, then the Son will give you eternal life, and the Son will raise you up at the last day. That's how much the Father loves the Son. Creation is by the Son and for the Son. It's all about the Son. That's how much the Father loves Him. And guess what? If the Father loves Him so much, we need to love Him the same way, don't we? I do, you don't. And then getting back to John 20, 28. Remember, what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. And notice what Jesus replies. He doesn't rebuke him. He says this. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, Wait a minute, he said, my Lord and my God. So what does that mean? Seeing and believing beyond the Son is seeing and believing that he's your Lord and your God. It's right there. Thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed with their own eyes. So no, it's, it's right there. Seeing the Son is seeing that he's your Lord and your God. Kyriosmu ketheosmu. And then verse 31 finishing you know, off, uh, not, the, not the final chapter of the fourth gospel, but getting close, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So Son of God means something. <laughs> you know what Son of God means? You're divine. Son of God means, just like it would in reality, right? If I'm the son of my father, but here's the difference. The Son of God has, and again, this is an illustration, has 100% the genetic material of the Father, is made completely of whatever the Father is made of. There's no mother involved and there's no creation. See, you and I stand in Scripture and other people listening. I come from my father and my mother genetically, and I'm made of the material of this creation. The Son of God, there only was the Father, right? He comes completely, 100% from the Father, and there's no created material. So what he's made of, that form, that substance, that essence, is exactly 100% the same of his Father. He's identical. He's the image. He's the uh, uh, character of the hypostasis. We saw it. I don't know what else you can say. Uh, Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Next verse. For as the heavens are higher than yours, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Yes, in reality, one being is one person. Well, guess what? God doesn't have to follow our rules. And God is a family, and that's why love is eternal, because you don't just love yourself, you love another person. And as you saw, the Father loved the Son prior to the foundation of the world. Eternal love. It's so beautiful. The Trinity, the truth of God, is beyond beautiful. Your Unitarian heresy just corrupts it all and turns it into junk, to tell you the truth, if you think about it. 
And notice, it says it right here. Just be, So you can't look at it, well, that's just not how things are in creation. Really? Explain this to me, Stan, in Scripture. Uh, there was a sperm and egg that made me, and there was a sperm and an egg that made you, and we're communicating. How does that happen? How can this be? <laughs> it blows your mind, right? Of course it does. So creation blows your mind, right? That's obvious. We both agree any person who's an atheist is beyond a fool if they can't see God everywhere, the power and majesty of God, right? Well, guess what? God doesn't have to follow our rules. God is a family. God is triune. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all God. One Lord, one family, one being, three persons. Eternal love, eternal family. Let's join the family. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. So you're going to continue being a fool. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Be wise. Stop being a fool. The teacher is God through me. Really stand on scripture. And again, notice, you're right. It's a lowercase God. Hmm. Who's a lowercase God? Satan's a lowercase God. You're teaching satanic falsehoods. Obviously not purposefully. That's not what you intend, but it is what you're doing. I pray you see this. I pray I spoke truth and interpret Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate it. If you could like, comment, share, subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.